So uh, I'm going to try to give you a perspective from computational neuroscience where uh, we're trying to build computational mathematical models of how brains process information and what I think this can bring into AI and sort of getting the eye actually into artificial intelligence, um, the intelligence part. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, I should begin by introducing the group which I work with here on campus, the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Um, so it's basically a collection of four PI labs, my, my own lab, uh, Fritz Summer, Mike DeWeese, and Chris Bouchard, and all the students and postdocs are, are part of our groups. And so many of the people uh, in, the, in the center, the students who come here, have backgrounds in, uh, in, in engineering and physics and mathematics. And uh, in addition to neuroscience and vision science and trying to bring ideas from these different uh, fields together uh, to understand how to, to understand how brains process information and where the computation is going on. So many of the ideas I'm going to tell you about today kind of fermented, have fermented in the Redwood Center over the years. Uh, and so uh, I think there's really three main points I want to uh, convey here. And that is one that uh, this, this goal of trying to build intelligent systems, uh, at least, you know, sort of intelligence in the way that, you know, trying to emulate things that we actually do, that humans uh, can do in the real world, uh, a lot, a, a lot of that, that goal um, has a lot to gain by exploiting the complexities found in biology, not ignoring them and try, not trying to simplify them away, but actually by, by embracing them and exploiting them and trying to understand them and use them. Uh, and, and the second is, and I, probably this is the most important of all, is sort of aiming, aiming your gun correctly or aiming your, 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 you know, your problem solving skills directly uh, in, the, in, the, in the right way. Uh, and, uh, and I sort of argue a lot of the problems that people are solving right now are kind of not really the right problems uh, to be, to be tr solving, or the right metrics to try to be uh, satisfying. And so, uh, so how, do we, how do we sort of, uh, sort of point our efforts in the right direction uh, better? And, and then finally, uh, you pointed to the uh, looking, looking at mathematics for uh, uh, some, some new directions there, and I, my own view is that the, the kind of math that we need to understand how brains work, uh, we don't have yet. So if you go to you know, mathematics departments across the country, you know, I, it's, I, I think they just don't know. And so we shouldn't just sort of accept the math as is, as like the stopping point. We should be looking for new kinds of mathematics that can help us conceptualize uh, things, that are, things that are going on. But I'll give just a few hints of a couple directions that I am personally excited about. Okay, so uh, so look at, looking at, uh, you know, biology and maybe sort of like contrasting where biology is, where neuroscience is, to where our field of AI is in terms of deep learning, because much of it is based right now on neural network models, mm -hmm. and sort of contrasting where those two things are at. Um, let's just kind of look at uh, how we got here. How did we get to this point? And this is just a depiction of the perceptron model, which... Uh, was uh, due to Frank Rosenblatt in, the, in 1959. And this was the 1950s, 1960s model of how neurons works, uh, work, work, which is basically that a neuron is a summing junction. It takes a bunch of signals and combines them uh, with different weights. So this is the inputs here. Each is weighted by a different amount. And then you just take a weighted sum of these inputs and pass it through a, a thresholding function. So what you get out is either a zero or one, which was loosely meant to correspond to either you know, spike or no spike. Um, and so, you know, the, basically, the conceptualized down here. And so, Rosenblatt showed how you can develop, how you can uh, train this system by example to adjust these weights to perform some function that was called the perceptron learning rule. That got people really excited in the 1960s uh, that you could do uh, that you could do things like this, and, and got people working to build multi-layer perceptrons. So there was a lot of experimentation going on then in the mid 1960s with multi-layer perceptrons, but they didn't have a learning rule for them because um, although they had, they had learning rules based on gradient descent due to Bernie Widrow uh, and others uh, at the time. They knew about gradient descent and stuff, uh, but they were stuck with this function here because if you built a multi-layer uh, network out of, this, out of these nonlinearities, well, they're not differentiable. And uh, so uh, it, uh, this is kind of one wet retrospective way of looking at it. Uh, it took people like 20 years to realize that uh, you can kind of sidestep that issue by making a smooth nonlinear function, and uh, then it's differentiable. Uh, and it's kind of remarkable, I, you know, I like to really emphasize this to my students because uh, there was nothing kind of, there was no big roadblock or showstopper that was preventing people in 1965 from doing something like this 
Um, Arthur Bryson was doing gradient descent with multilayer neural networks. They were doing it with linear neur neural networks mainly. And uh, so they were really just kind of one step away. Any graduate student could have made, or you know, elementary <laughs> high school student could have made this observation uh, that, you could, um, that you could simply smooth nonlinearity and then make it differentiable. Uh, so this led, this, this you know, innovation of being able to have these things differentiable now allowed people to stack these uh, neurons in multiple layers. And that was a huge advance that came in the mid-1980s uh, as a result. And that, and that produced, produced a whole other wave of excitement. And, and then we have the deep learning sort of revolution that's occurring today, which utilizes these so-called ReLU nonlinearities, uh, where instead of uh, sort of saturating at the top, uh, people kind of noticed, well, you know, why, why clip the output like that? You're just kind of losing information. You need some kind of nonlinearity, so let's just threshold to the bottom, but leave, you know, give it the full lin linear dynamic range here. And that, that seems to work better. And so, so, that, you know, so it's kind of remarkable that in 50 years, uh, the only thing that's been changing in this model is what you put inside that box there, uh, going from a step function to a smooth sigmoid function to a ReLU nonlinearity. Uh, and so that's basically what you know, is, is, is happening today. And the other component of, uh, of today's sort of deep learning models that are powering a lot of AI is the idea of hierarchy, sort of stacking these, these neurons in layers, which, um, and the so-called convolutional model, the ConvNet, and this is really due to Fukushima, who developed this model in the 19, uh, in 1980. And he based this idea really based on Hubel and Weasel's hierarchical model. So he was very inspired by things happening in neuroscience. But again, this, this is a model that Hubel and Weasel described in 1965. Their hierarchical model of feature extraction, beginning with simple features in the retina, orientation detectors, sort of linear orientation filters in, in V1, followed by complex cells that kind of pooled or averaged over position. To, to build some position invariance and then so-called hyper-complex cells which re would respond to more complex shapes. So they had this model they proposed in the mid-60s based on a hierarchy of feature extraction. Fukushima is reading this work and he said, well, you know, gosh, that sounds really interesting. What can I do with that? Let's meet, I'll build a computational model and see if I can train it to, to, to do some simple object recognition tasks. And that, that was this model called the Neocogatron. And he trained it be, with uh, heavy learning. So it's just simply an unsupervised network trained without a teacher, he pr printed in a bunch of images of handwritten digits here, uh, and then it has these feature extractors in different layers, uh, and then a complex cell pooling layer, followed by another layer of feature extraction and pooling. So it basically had a, a sort of form of sparse coding on it, uh, based on winner-take-all learning, winner-take-all competition, and then a he simple heavy learning rule all the way up the chain here. And then you show when you present with simple letters here that the top layer can uh, self-organize to, to classify different digits in the input, invariant to position. And so basically, uh, in my view, all the convenants we see today, they're basically neo neocognitrons. Uh, so it's, it all really kind of stems from this work. There's very little different. They're just simply using backprop instead of unsupervised learning. Uh, but it's the same basic idea. And uh, Fukushima is a very humble man. Uh, he doesn't have a cool Twitter feed to promote all his work and stuff like that. So a lot of people don't really acknowledge him, I think, as much as he uh, deserves. But he's really kind of, in my view, the founding father of, uh, of modern deep learning. Okay, and, and really kind of made the remarkable advance of showing what you can gain by stacking things in a hierarchy and, and getting progressively higher degrees of abstraction as you go um, from left to right. Okay, so nevertheless, though, you know, I think the thing to notice here is that all these models we're working today, we're working with today, they're based on conceptualizations of neurons that were made in the 1960s. Okay, the basic idea of thinking of a neuron as a linear summing junction followed by a threshold and stacking neurons in layers like this, um, basically inspired by Hubel and Weasel's model. Okay, and, and so, uh, our, our dis so, but in the meantime, neuroscience has really advanced remarkably uh, over the past 50 years, um, and, and our models have not really caught up. And so I wanna give you just a few examples of this. So one is just think about what a single neuron is doing. Uh, and uh, so, so this is just a picture of one, one specific type of neuron in the brain, a so-called pyramidal cell, showing all its dendritic processes. So this is where all the inputs come into, into, into the cell, and it does some computation with that. And if there's anything we know now from modern neuroscience that a neuron is not doing, um, it's not doing this. In other words, it's not doing what a perceptron computation says. It's just a weighted sum passing it through a, through a, through a single, single, um, through a single thresholding function of the soma. But, but rather, what happens in real neurons is that there's all kinds of nonlinearities in the dendritic tree. So within any dendritic branch here, 
there's many different compartments you could divide it into, and the inputs coming into any one branch locally within the, in, within the dendritic tree combine nonlinearly. Uh, they combine sometimes multiplicatively uh, and, uh, or divisively, and there's all kinds of interesting kinds of inter interactions that can occur there. Uh, one way that people have tried to sort of model this uh, is uh, uh, the, which Bartlett Mel originally proposed in the, uh, in the early 1990s is the so-called sigma pi model. And it's called the sigma pi because it's a sum of products. So you think of like each compartment on the generated tree is taking a local product of inputs. And then, and then the neuron is taking a weighted sum of all these different products happening on the dendritic tree. So this would be maybe, perhaps make a better model of a neuron, but still, I, I think, way off in terms of capturing the actual com computational complexity. These, these neurons are sensitive to coincidences among spikes. So in other words, if spikes arrive at the same time within a millisecond of each other or so, then that's going to have a, a, a better, a more, a more efficacy than neurons that arrive out of synchrony and things like that. So there's, there's a whole complex cascade of things happening. A neuron is an extremely uh, complex device and actually modeling how complex it is is something we, we, we still don't know. And so, so one thing I think to understand here is though, that is rather than trying to simplify the neuron into a simple perceptron, we should embrace this complexity. There's a lot more you can do. This is a much richer computation. And there's a lot more we could do with these types of neurons than the simple neurons we use in our model today. Okay, another is embracing the complexity of cortical circuits. So any one part of the cortex is not like a single layer of a neural network that you typically see in a ComNet. So within, a, within one part of cortex, there are multiple layers itself. And this is just shown here, the so-called canonical microcircuit model of uh, Douglas and Martin. And this is just sim simply showing a cross-section of cortex going from the superficial layers, layer one at the top, to the deeper layers, layer six down here at the bottom, and this is white matter down here. And this is just showing a handful of filled neurons from Douglas and Martin's lab, uh, where the, uh, the dark parts, they're just colored uh, 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 blue and yellow uh, randomly just to sort of differentiate them so it's not just all one big kind of mess. Uh, but the, the, for each neuron, the dark part uh, indicates the dendrites, and the light part indicates the axons. So these are the, all the axons of one neuron, and these are the, all the dendrites of one neuron. Okay, reaching up here into the superficial layers. And this is for just another neuron, the dark part is the dendrites and the light part is the axons. Okay, so um, they're, they're ramifying and sort of branching in very complex ways within the neural tissue, connecting, connecting different layers of computation within, within the cortex. And uh, understanding what these different layers uh, are doing is really one of the goals of modern neuroscience still. But one thing we do know in terms of way of characterizing it is this layer four this layer four here is important because it's the input layer of the cortex. So the inputs from the thalamus come into layer four, uh, and then they in turn project onto layer two, three here, mainly that's the main target, is layer two, three. And then within layer two, three, there's a vast array of horizontal connections. They're not really shown here, but neurons that spread the information laterally across the cortex. So there's a vast mixing of information. It's a highly recurrent circuit. Okay, so it's not like these neurons are kind of keeping information private and just sort of taking the information from below. There are a vast mixing of information these nonlinear, with these nonlinear computations going on here in layer two, three. They, they in turn project down to layer five, which in turn has a whole slew of, of horizontal connections here. And layer five down, then projects to motor structures, and layer six projects back down to the, to the thalamus. Okay, so the, the thing to convey here is that there's, a, there's just a huge amount of structure here uh, in these cortical circuits, computational structure. So it's undoubtedly a different computational role for these neurons in layer four, as opposed to these neurons, neurons in layer two, three, as opposed to the neurons down here. They're probably doing very different computations uh, that support perception, that support cognition. What exactly those are, we don't know, but this is something that uh, I think the computational community could really help in, is you know, rather than sort of treating this as a single slab of a neural network, uh, let's try to embrace that and really understand it and exploit it. Uh, in, 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 the, in these models, especially these horizontal, these, this re these recurrent connections where information is intermixed and try to understand why is that useful, why is that a good thing for the system to do. Uh, another um, aspect, and this is kind of one of the aspects of the architecture that inspired deep learning, Fukushima's model, is the, uh, is the fact that these cortical areas are, 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 uh, appear to be kind of stacked in a hierarchy. And this is being shown, uh, illustrated here. This is a redrawing of the famous Van Essen Fellman diagram that charts out the connections of all the different areas within the visual cortex. So each box here corresponds to a different uh, distinct visual area within the visual cortex. Area V1 is the primary visual cortex. Area V2 is the second, second visual area and so forth. 
Area V4 is another area involved in uh, object or form processing. And these areas here are largely involved in object recognition. Okay, so one interesting sort of trend as you proceed from left to right in this diagram is that you tend to go from very low-level image-related features. So these neurons in V1 are basically coding properties of the image, irrespective of what they mean in the world. This, this, is, this is how we think about it. Uh, and these neurons in the right, especially in these boxes, they're encoding properties of the world uh, and not so much tied to image properties. So they're coding things about objects. These are coding information about relative spatial relationships in the world that are useful for navigation and reaching and, and things like that. Okay, so, so I, I think what the deep learning community has kind of taken from this is kind of, okay, well, there's a hierarchy here and let's stack our layers and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, sort of get something interesting at the top here. So they're, they're trying to sort of capture aspects like that. But uh, one thing to bear in mind here is this is a very cortico-centric, this is a very cortico-centric point of view. These are all cortical areas. Um, and another thing that's going on here that's not, not shown in this diagram is the thalamus. So down here are these two important thalamic areas. One is the LGM, which pr provides input to uh, V1, from, uh, relays information from the retina. And the other is the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus, which relieves, receives uh, projections from all these different cortical areas, and in a sense kind of re recapitulates the cortical hierarchy. So in, in, in the same way that there's different areas up here in the cortex, there's different areas down here in the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. So all these cortical areas are projecting information down to the pulvinar in the thalamus, <clears throat> and the pulvinar in the thalamus is in turn projecting back up to them. What in the world is this doing? Nobody has any idea, okay? I, I mean, the field would be, I mean, some people will tell you that it's doing, it's involved in attention, and it is. Definitely, if you lesion the pulvinar, you get def deficits in attention, and there seems to be some kind of, uh, uh, you know, evidence for that. But uh, there's really kind of almost zero computational theory of, of, of what this kind of system is doing and how it works. The closest actually is the theory of uh, uh, Murray Sherman and Ray Guillory, and they think that this is basically a, a hierarchy of nested sensory motor loops. And so what's interesting about their theory is that what they point out is all these different cortical areas, this is not just kind of like a perceptual apparatus here. All these different cortical areas, the layer five neurons, uh, have, have layer five neurons which project to motor structures. So for example, V1 has layer five neurons which project to the superior colliculus, which in turn drives eye movements. Layer two, V2 also projects to the superior colliculus, right? And many of the other areas, but the, these project, project to maybe, you know, head, head sort of uh, head movement areas or reaching, reaching movements and things like that. I'm sorry? Frontal okay, frontal eye fields, yeah. So if there's all, yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure if that's on here, but okay. Um, and so the, the point is that all these areas have outputs. And so this is one, one big disconnect between the, the sort of fundamental neuroanatomy and organization of the system and the way that we currently conceptualize uh, n uh, these deep, deep learning networks is that this is not just computing one big nonlinear function, right? It's not like there's a top box. So in the sort of deep learning point of view, this would be the input, and the stuff over on the right would be the output. And then all the stuff in the middle is just in service to the top box. It's just helping you compute some nonlinear function that can classify faces or, you know, command a robot to do something or whatever. It's just stuff in the middle uh, that's, that's, that's helping you compute this big function f of x. So x is the input, and then you pass x to the network, which is f. W are the parameters, all the weights within the neural network, and you're trying to train this big nonlinear function to do some task, which is like the top box up here. And what the neuroanatomy tells us and the physiology tells us is fundamentally that's not the kind of system it is. That's entirely the wrong way to conceptualize it, right? If you start, if you start from that framework, you're not going to gain any insights about what the system is doing, and you're going to be totally missing the boat. And as well, you're not exploiting the rich structure here, right? This is, this is fundamental to how we behave, how we drive cars, how we eat, how we recognize images, how we do everything in the world. And, uh, and, and this was, if we really, really want to understand how we do these things, we have to understand this circuit and how the thalamus and cortex work, work together. As well as the fact that these all, almost all this information flow, this is something that's still very non-intuitive to us, how all this information flow is essentially bi-directional. Okay, so it's bi-directional inflammation flow between, between cortex and thalamus, but also between all these cortical areas. So it's not shown in these, in these black bands between areas. The thickness of these black bands denotes how much white matter is devoted to them. Let's just go back a little bit. The thickness of these wires denotes how much white matter is devoted to these connections. But all these connections you see are, are essentially bidirectional. So V1 projects to V2, V2 projects to back to V1. Okay, so why would you want to do that? LGN relays information to V1, V1 projects back to LGN and modifies 
the representation here that's in turn sent back to Cortex. Okay, why is that good? How does that help you see? This is something, again, that, are, that the field of neuroscience would greatly benefit from computational theories that provide insight. Um, and, 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 and vice versa, uh, the field of computational vision would have much to gain probably by incorporating these kinds of structures in their models and make much richer visual systems. Okay, and then finally, I show, you know, another way that these systems are off is not just sort of in the correspondence to neuroscience and sort of mismatch of like structure of the neural network and structure of the brain, but in terms of their behavior on visual classification tasks. So this is really some really neat work that came um, out recently from Matthias Betke's lab, where they, uh, you've probably heard of this work where you, you can sort of create these uh, so-called adversarial examples for neural networks, where you take a picture of a bus and perturb the pixels a little bit and then it classifies it as a fire hydrant or a penguin or something completely different, right? And so they're trying to get to the bottom of this and understand, well, why is that, why is that happening? And what they're showing is that these neural networks, these convnets, basically are, are just looking at bags of features. So they're taking all these, they're taking an image like this of a flamingo and putting that image basically through the blender and, and just sort of extracting all these features and then pooling them and summing across the whole image. And, and then it says, well, as long as you give me that collection of features, then I'll classify as a flamingo, I'll cl classify that as a grasshopper or whatever. And so these are images to the right here. These are images which, which they've generated for the network, uh, which uh, have, you know, basically have the same features as this and fool the neural network into saying, well, it's the same category as this with very, very high confidence, okay? So, so this, is, this is what you're sort of witnessing here is the null space of, of the neural network model. It basically thinks that everything here in this row is equivalent. It has no way of differentiating these things from each other. Everything in this row is considered to be equivalent. Everything in this row is, is considered to be equivalent. Okay, this is the way these neural networks see the world. And obviously that's a very poor perceptual model if you're trying to capture the way things, uh, thing, we, we do things. Okay, so let's go back to these original models that we, that, uh, that we introduced at the beginning, the, the, the so-called, the perceptron model and the, uh, the, the convnet model of uh, Fukushima, which essentially all of deep learning today is based on these, these, two, these two basic ideas. And, and, you know, ask now, well, where did these models come from that we're using, right? We have uh, tons of GPUs all over the country that are burning lots of heat right now simulating very seriously these models, okay? And where'd they come from? And the astonishing thing we find when we really think about it is that, well, they're not based on biology, not at all. Uh, they're not based on perception. I mean, they don't do perception very well. They're not based on any insights in perception, and nor are they based on mathematics. And this may seem odd because you can certainly write down a mathematical formula that describes what the neural network does, but you can write down a mathematical formula for anything right, that, you, that you come up with. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that they're not based on any kind of first principles, re first principles reasoning from mathematics that would sort of lead you to believe a priori that a weighted sum and thresholding is a good thing to do, right? Or that a covnet, per se, is a good thing to do, or st stacking the things in a hierarchy, that that's a good thing to do. Okay, it's just kind of based on loose kind of biological mimicry. Okay, so let's, let's take a casual look at a neuron and say, make, maybe it's because sort of loose model of what it does and things like that. Okay, so it's not really based on anything. All this stuff that we're taking very seriously today in, in these neural networks, it's not based on anything. That should shock you, okay? Uh, I, I, and so it's, uh, it's something that, I, 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 I'm not, okay, shouldn't, I don't mean to be too critical, right? But the point is to inspire you, inspire others to think bigger, right? So that was, this is a great start where the field is now. I think it's, you know, obviously some gains we've made. Uh, these networks do very interesting things, so let's, uh, let's uh, you know, take some comfort in that. But the point is, I guess I'm trying to make here, is that there's a lot, a lot, more, lot, more, uh, lot more headroom, a, lot, a longer ways to go, and much more that we could exploit to, to do better. Okay, so, uh, so then, uh, so what should we be doing? So I argued that these, these neural networks really aren't solving the right problem. So formulating the, corte formulating the cortex as f of x semicolon w is not really the right, right way to conceptualize what a brain is doing and uh, or trading on a classification task. Okay, so how should we, how should we sort of uh, point our efforts in, in the right direction? And uh, what I'm gonna argue here is that there's um, some places we can turn to uh, for inspiration. And, uh, and so one is not be beyond just the brain itself, actually. So one is animal behavior. 
Uh, another is psychophysics, a philosophy I think has a lot to teach us, and also uh, mathematics. So I'll just go through a couple of these in, in turn. So let's first turn to uh, animal, beha animal behavior. So these are just uh, four examples of, uh, from the animal kingdom, kingdom of animals that uh, do not only vision, but electrosensation and all kinds of other groovy things. So I'll just kind of talk about them a little bit here. Uh, the jumping spider has a total of eight eyes, and these two forward-looking eyes in the front have very large lenses and give the jumping spider very high resolution with which, with which it can do pattern vision. So a jumping spider can basically recognize another spider, conspecific, just from vision alone. It can navigate three-dimensional mazes. Uh, it can do all kinds of amazing things with its visual system. It's very visually aware of its environment. It uses this, uh, the eyes on the side of its head. You can't see them. On the, they're actually pointing off to the side to detect things that move. And when it sees something that moves, like a, like a fly that it wants to capture, then it rotates its head to it, towards it to image it with these high-resolution eyes. And I'll show you later that these high-resolution eyes actually have a one-dimensional strip. The retina is a 1D strip, and then it scans that back and forth to, to view the image. Okay, so it's really remarkable behavior. And, uh, and so, as, and, you know, so when we look at all these animals, we have to sort of think about this question, well, what problem are they solving? Right? What problem are they solving? Well, object recognition is one of it, right? They want to recognize conspecifics, but that's, you know, like the tip of the iceberg. There's a ton of other problems they're solving to navigate around in the world. Uh, the sand wasp is another remarkable example. It has a compound eye, and uh, un unlike these sort of camera-like eyes that the jumping spiders have, uh, so the, the compound eye actually has very low resolution, so we cannot recognize, you know, spiders or other conspecifics just from their visual system alone. It has a very blurry view of the world, but it's very good at tracking, tracking things at high speed in motion. And one of the things that sand wasp does, it, well, it hunts bees, it hunts uh, bees as far as a mile away from its nest. It builds its nest in the sand. That's why it's called the sand wasp. It has just a whole, like a burrow in the sand where that, that's its home. And then it can fly as, mi uh, as far as a mile away from home to capture a bee and bring it back to its nest. And so Nick and Nico Tinbergen wondered, well, how do they do that? How do they navigate and find their, find their way home? And not only that, but even when they get in the vicinity of their nest, how do they find this little hole in the ground, which is their, which is their nest? And what he showed is that they can actually recognize from the debris sitting around the nest, the, the, nest, the pattern of debris, the, two, the spatial pattern of debris sitting around the nest, uh, they can recognize where, where home is. So they can do some kind of pattern vision from that, you know, remarkably while they're sort of flying around uh, in, in the world. And so, uh, again, really remarkable capacity to navigate. The box jellyfish, uh, even perhaps even more remarkable, doesn't even have a brain, right? But it has a remarkable visual system. And has a total of 24 eyes. And at least four of these eyes have very high resolution. So Dan Nielsen has taken these in the lab and shown that their, their lens is actually aberration free. It forms a, like a perfect a uh, perfect image. It's better even than, than our lens, right? So it's like uh, amazingly perfectly evolved lens. And these, these, uh, these, uh, these, these eyes here point towards the water surface. So they have little counterweights on them that always keep the eye pointed towards the water surface no matter what direction the, the box jellyfish is oriented in. And it's thought that they're using as a visual system to kind of survey the terrestrial landscape around it. So not just the stuff in the water, but they're looking at the stuff above the water surface to know where, where it is within the riverbanks, whether it's on the side or in the middle and so forth, because of the prey uh, that they prey upon uh, that hangs out in the, in the, in the riverbanks. And this other example, the weekly electric fish, they can see, they do have eyes, but their main way of ascertaining things about the world is by generating an electric field. So they have an electric organ back here which generates an electric field, not to stun other animals or fish. Uh, it actually just uses it as a sensing apparatus. And so they, they, it generates these electric fields, and then it has these electrosensors all over the skin surface, which detect distortions in the electric field. And that's how it sort of ascertains what's out there. So stuff, matter out there in the world that conducts, that's conducting material, will tend to condense these electric field lines, and other material will tend to leave them more spaced apart. And it actually has a fovea, a much more dense region of packed electrosensory organs that it uses to form a more sort of high resolution image of how the electric field is distorted. Okay, so it's an interesting question to ask, well, how does the world appear to electric fish? Uh, but uh, it can, it never, suffice it to say, they can do three-dimensional navigation based on electrosensation. So if they, this has been shown in the lab. They can sort of, just by how the electric field is distorted around them, they get a sense of three-dimensional space and they can navigate around objects and they can find objects to hunt and prey upon and so forth. 
Okay, so these are, I think, really remarkable examples to contemplate and think about. These are all an animals that have been wandering the planet long before we were doing it. They don't play Go, they don't play chess, uh, but I would say that you know, this is a kind of intelligence. This is a kind of intelligence that our field has yet to comprehend and grasp. Uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenon within, within the, uh, not a phenomenon, but a, a paradox in the robotics community called Moravec's paradox. And this is named for the roboticist Hans, Hans Moravec, who kind of observed that, you know, it'll, it will, isn't it kind of curious that we can build now computers that can play chess, they can play Go, they can do all these remarkable so-called so intellectual feats, but they can't even stand up and open a door, uh, you know, let alone do these things here. Okay, so there's just something about dealing with the real three-dimensional world, the physical environment, just, you know, coping in the three-dimensional world, wind blows on you, sand blows in your face, all kinds of unpredictable things happen, and you have the robustness, you have the ability to survive and, and deal with these unpredictable events, and a kind of general intelligence in a way that can deal with unforeseen circumstances um, all the time. Okay, this is, sort of, this is something to kind of wrap our heads around and, uh, and, and think about solving these kinds of problems. Uh, so uh, so that, that's animal behavior. I mentioned psychophysics. There's a bunch of interesting findings in psychophysics which I think tell us much about, they, they give us a very, a very strong hints about what's going on inside the brain without ever putting electrode into the brain. But I'll point you to one really uh, astounding one in particular. This is the work of Ken Nakayama and, Sh and Shinshimojo and Hijang Se, uh, uh, he, he, Sijang He, that occurred during, in the mid-1990s. And that's the work on visual surface representation. So what they showed through uh, a series of very cleverly designed experiments is that contrary to previous uh, thought, and this is kind of the story that I grew up on, is the Kovnet story, kind of like the Fukushima idea, the, the theory that basically what's happening in the cortex is you have neurons that are extracting like two-dimensional features, like little line detectors, and you have corner detectors. This is like the Hubel Weasel you know, story. Uh, and then in V2, you would have even more complex neurons, maybe things that determine, uh, detect key junction, T junctions or uh, curvature detectors and things like that. Uh, that contrary to that idea, that that's, you know, that, that that's not what the system is doing. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't simply extract features from the two-dimensional image. Rather, very quickly, it gets into a three-dimensional format. It takes the image pixel data and tries to make an explicit representation of surfaces. For example, the surfaces of these tables, they would be labeled e differently even in within V1. Those neurons in V1 really have information about the properties of that surface and how it extends in three-dimensional space and moreover where, it bound where its boundaries are. Okay? That information is spread across surfaces within, the, within these cortical representations and stops at the edges of these surfaces. Okay, so I can't go into the details here. I'll just turn you to this paper. It's, it's a wonderful paper because it, it just sort of summarizes all their experimental findings and it sort of shows one after the other that uh, sort of argue in terms of this surface view rather than this point of view. So this really kind of orients you differently, not only as a neurophysiologist, it says really if you're doing neurophysiology on these cortical areas, you should be sort of examining it in a different way and asking different questions and using different kinds of stimuli. But also as a computational person trying to build models of the system, you shouldn't be just building little Covnet features that sort of detect two-dimensional uh, features from the image. You should be trying to sort of look for something different and extracting something more related to surfaces. This is a really important aspect of representation. So uh, he, he gives some, so one of the examples that he, they rely upon in this work is simple phenomenology. So I'll give you an example of this uh, phenomenology here with, uh, and it's a striking example of our, our brains to sort of pull out surface structure from, from a scene. And so this is an image of something. If you've seen it before, uh, don't speak, uh, but uh, if you, um, if you haven't seen it before, I'll just ask you, does anybody here, do any of you uh, recognize what you're looking at? Show of hands, if you've not. Yes? No? Okay, no hands. Um, all right, so it kind of just looks like maybe a sort of amorphous set of white and black, white and black splotches in this scene here. And uh, so in this particular case, one, one subject was asked to draw what they see and this object, this is one way of sort of interrogating the visual system is to you know, ask the person to draw what they see. And so this is what one subject drew uh, as a line drawing to depict this scene here. Just, they just do the boundaries of these sort of different black and white splotches. So for those of you who couldn't see the figure in this scene, how many of you would, it, would, would agree that this is sort of a reasonable depiction? You would draw something like that? Okay, fair number, fair number of hands. 
Okay, so, so now I'm going to tell you what's here, um, what the figure is. It's a cow. Was that enough? <laughs> For some people, that's enough, just to say, say cow, because the minute you, 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 you think about cow, you sort of try to fit a cow model to it, then you can start to see it. Okay, so I'll tell you a little more. Uh, this is the head of the cow. And this is the snout. And then here are the eyes. That's an eye there. There's another eye over here. Okay? And uh, so now you ask the subject to draw what they see after they've seen the cow. And uh, this is what they draw. <laughs> so it's kind of remarkable, right? I mean, the same subject drew this. And then, you know, a few minutes later, they drew this. So the only thing that's different is what's inside their head. Okay, so when they initially saw this figure without knowing what it is, they had one representation inside their head, and when you interrogate that representation, it just tells you about the boundaries. This is like just the idea of extracting two-dimensional features. This is something like the representation in your retina. Your retina has a representation like this. It's just sort of expiring to the boundaries, two-dimensional features within the image, because that's all it knows about. It's not trying to build a model of the world. It's just representing data about the world. That's the data. Okay, that's just the image data. Okay, now this comes from inside your head. This is a model. This is a model that's made up, not out of nothing, but is basically conjured up inside your head, and that's what you're experiencing here. And this model is, is consists mainly of surfaces. Okay, so you, so you sort of so see this is one surface, and you see this is another surface. Because this person, note that they drew a boundary here, right? And that person had no right to draw a boundary from the data alone. I mean, there's absolutely zero evidence for a boundary there in the raw image data. Okay? Nevertheless, the subject says, well, this is one surface belonging to the head, and this is another surface. Okay, moreover, you're explaining away all kinds of details about these black and white boundaries. These black and white boundaries, which were kind of undifferentiated to you before, you'd probably say this is due to the cow's reflectance, like this is black fur, this is white fur. Maybe this is something like a black and white uh, uh, cow, right? And uh, whereas this boundary here, where it's white here, it's black here, you say, well, that's due to the three-dimensional shape of the cow. That's due to the structure of the head. That's telling you something about the shape from the shading information. Okay, so you're explaining away all kinds of details. It's a very layered representation, but it's entirely in terms of surfaces. And then there's this idea of the cow. Okay, you know it's a cow, the high-level classification. But, 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 uh, but a lot of it is just sort of perceiving the rich, very rich three-dimensional structure of the scene. Uh, and, and this is kind of the basis of of what's going on inside your head. So this is what Nakayama is arguing from psychophysics, is that you really need to think about how the brain sort of gets into this kind of format of representation, like a 3D surface representation, as opposed to just extracting uh, 2D features, like cur you know, lines and curves and things like that. Okay, the, the, the fourth, I'm sorry, the third one, the third uh, sort of area I mentioned to turn to is philosophy. And uh, I'll just point you to a really beautiful piece of work by a pair of philosophers. One is Alvin Noe, who's now here at UC Berkeley, and uh, Kevin O'Regan, who is maybe a philosopher slash uh, psychologist. And uh, this is what they're, this is what's a, a really sort of a landmark paper. It came out in 2001 in BBS, and it's what they call it is a sensory motor account of visual and visual, a vision and visual consciousness. So they're trying to sort of look at this problem of visual awareness, and where is the, you know, if you're looking for the neural correlate of visual awareness, how to, how to go about doing that. And uh, so I'll just summarize the abstract here. Uh, this is just a few sort of key sentences from the abstract. And what they're, what they're sort of coming in and saying is that uh, seeing or vision is a way of acting. Okay, this is just like totally uh, anathema to the way to the vision people think about vision, okay? Uh, but they're saying, look, a vision is not about building an internal representation of the world or building a, building a visual representation. Seeing is really a way of acting, with the, uh, acting in the world. And that the activity in, in, in these internal representations does not generate the experience of seeing. Okay, so rather they're saying the experience of seeing occurs when the organism masters this, the governing laws of sensory motor contingency. So what is sensory motor contingency? What that is simply is the joint space of sensors and actuators. Okay, so at any given time in your nervous system, you have sensors which are telling you information about the world, not just visual sensors, auditory sensors, some other touch sensors and so forth. And you have actuators, you have, you have motor neurons that are commanding movements and, and in turn proprioception that tells you what actually happened with your arm. 
And what they're arguing is something here in this paper, very profound. They're saying that in this joint space, in this joint space of the sensors and the actuators, lies the physical laws of the, of the, of the three-dimensional world. Okay, and, the, and later work that, that Kevin O'Regan did with uh, his postdoc, David Filippona, and through computer simulation, they just took a very simple robot, robotic creature with all kinds of cameras attached to it and all kinds of actuators and showed that from this joint space you could discover the six degrees of freedom of the physical world. Okay, so it's a very rich idea both computationally and neurophysiologically. I think if you sort of get on board with this idea, it makes you think about what, the, what all those boxes in the visual cortex are doing in a very different way. And uh, so, so I think it's a beautiful example of where philosophy helps to point us in the right direction of what questions to ask and what to look for and what, maybe what problems to solve, how to sort of go about um, um, solving, solving these problems. Okay, and then, uh, and then uh, maybe as a, as so, so an example of this idea of the sensory motor, sensory motor contingencies uh, and you know, animals that use this, uh, we'll, t we'll turn back here to the jumping spider. So, uh, so this is just showing you a sort of cross-section inside the jumping spider's head these eight eyes, so these two forward-looking eyes, two other eyes on the side also pointing forward. These eyes on the side have fisheye lenses with like 360-degree coverage point uh, of view, but very blurry. And then these two tiny eyes are pit eyes here on the side of the head, so a total of eight eyes, four pairs of eyes. And this is just a video of a baby jumping spider, a one-day-old jumping spider. Uh, and because it's an infant jumping spider, the, the exoskeleton is translucent, so you can see through it. And so you can, so you can see these tubes moving back and forth inside its head. So its retina, so its retina is at the end of these tubes here. Okay, so the retina is back here, and the retina is basically a one-dimensional strip of photoreceptors. Okay, these are showing the photoreceptors here. They're basically they're just arranged in a one-dimensional di one strip, not a two-D array. And they take this array and they scan it back and forth by moving that tube back and forth. Okay, so you can see that moving back and forth inside the head. So this is very much an active process. It's like the whiskers of a rat when it whisks, right? Okay, so it's moving this thing back and forth, and as it collects information about the world, then it has to somehow put it together. It's the sensory motor contingency. How, how the sensory information, just looking at this, if you just looked at these information alone from these, from these pixels, that would tell you nothing. It would be almost meaningless. In order to interpret this, you have to know how the eye is moving at the same time, and then you can, then you can sort of learn something about the world. Okay, so it uses this in abundance, and then, you know, this is just an example, the jumping spider. Again, a one-day-old jumping spider. This is remarkable for many other reasons but it's just uh, attending to uh, a fruit fly, so it's gonna jump out and capture it later in part of this uh, strip. Uh, we won't see it here, but, um, but uh, it uh, you know, has this remarkable uh, ability to attend, as I mentioned earlier, and it's all sort of an active process. So it's, you know, it's moving through the world, it's getting all this information from its eyes, and uh, it does vision in a very different, and we do vision in a different, very different way than, than the field right now uh, sort of thinks about it in terms of the standard view. Okay, finally, mathematics. <laughs> and uh, so, so what can math teach us? And uh, so I, I, I'll just highlight here two, two, I think, really interesting frameworks that have come out rather recently. And one is this uh, so-called pattern theory that was due to, originally to Ulf Grenander at Brown University and then was popularized uh, more recently by David Mumford and in, summarized also in this book by the same name, Pattern Theory, and Ulf Grenander has another book by the same name, Pattern Theory. Okay, so basically Dump David Mumford is kind of trying to translate it to the computational vision community. But what, basically what they're doing, what David Mumford is doing, so he's a mathematician, and he's looking at this problem from vision, uh, the problem of vision from a mathematical point of view, and saying, okay, what are the, what are the fundamental problems that need to be solved? Okay, or what, what is this sort of, what's the, what's the mathematical structure of this problem? And what he says is, okay, well, there's three kind of components to it. What, one thing they call sparse discreteness, the fact that there's patterns in the world, okay? So there's like, you know, they think of those as letters of the alphabet or the shapes of objects and things like that, okay? So there's particular kinds of patterns that you see in the world, and they're rather discrete. They're like categories, okay? The other, and this is another type of pattern that we don't often think about, is transformations. So as we move through the world, these images that fall into our retina are highly dynamic, okay? So things are transforming, this information, these patterns that fall in our retina, they transform over time. And the transformations are a kind of pattern in, the, in, the, in their own right. Okay, so that's another fundamental thing to describe. And then hierarchy, the idea that uh, holes, are or holes are composed of parts, parts are in, in turn composed of subparts, and so forth, okay? And then so he goes about in this work, trying to develop a mathematical framework or, or sort of attacking each of these problems. You know, it's, it's not by, by any means the solution to all these problems, 
but it's a, it's a wonderful start and, uh, and, uh, and way to go. And I'll just maybe uh, highlight one, one, uh, one, uh, one recent piece of work from my own lab that tries to sort of tie together these two things, the sparse discreteness, what we call sparse coding, and the transformations, what we call manifold learning or manifold flattening, and something we call the sparse manifold transform, which tries to basically take this idea of a sparse code, the discreteness that Mumford is talking about, and organize it into a smooth, uh, a lower dimensional manifold, which expresses the transformation. So the idea is when you do this, when you actually take a sparse representation and map it into a low dimensional manifold, that makes explicit these transformations that are occurring in the, in, in the input. And this was, this was very much inspired, in, in Yubei's mind, it was inspired by David Mumford's pattern theory, the, this mathematical framework. And so uh, it's, given, it's given us a lot of mileage. And another idea from mathematics is uh, this, this idea of computing with high dimensional vectors. And so I'll just highlight one of the main proponents of this the field uh, here, uh, Penti Kinerva, who's uh, here, researcher at Berkeley. Uh, but this idea really stems from early work uh, by Tony Plate, who was a student in Jeff Hinton's lab in the mid-1990s. So the original paper by Tony Plate is here. It was called Holographic Reduced Representations. And, and then Penti Kinerva sort of more, more recently tried to popularize this, maybe, I, I don't know, this loose word for it, I mean, maybe sort of tried to extend the theory in various ways. And, and he calls it hyperdimensional computing, or the idea of computing with high dimensional vectors. Uh, but the basic idea is just shown here is that basically everything in this framework is, is represented with a high dimensional vector rather than a single neuron. Okay, so if you think about it, many of our neural network models are really based on single neuron thinking. So back in the 1950s, 1960s, when people first started probing the brain, they're using electrode, they poke into the brain, and out of all those millions of neurons sitting there, they record from one neuron and they listen to its actual potentials, and they try to create a story. They say, oh, that neuron is a feature detector. That neuron is a fly detector, right? That neuron is a speed detector. That neuron is a color detector, okay? So they sort of developed this kind of single neuron way of thinking about what the nervous system is doing, and we've kind of embraced that in our models. All these perceptron-based deep learning models are really fundamentally single neuron models, okay? It's all in the spirit of like, this neuron does that, that neuron does that, or what we also call labeled lines. And Penti's kind of uh, observation, the way he's coming at it, and also Tony Plate, is that uh, really when you look at the nervous system, it's not like that. It's, you, what you see is these very large high dimensional circuits. So many neurons together, they're all highly densely occurred to each other. So thinking of the neuron as a fundamental unit may not be the right starting point. You wanna rather think as a, a, of a population, a large population of neurons, or what other, pe also, other people also call a cell assembly, that uh, that's, that's the right starting point and way to sort of think about uh, representation. So, so the idea in this framework, everything is represented by a high dimensional vector, so on the order of 10,000 bits. And there's three fundamental operations. Uh, multiplication used for binding, addition used for combining things, and then uh, permutation used for sequences, okay? And uh, again, I, you know, these weren't just sort of pulled out of the blue. These were formulated really from first principles thinking, uh, thinking about like, what do I need to do? If these are the things I need to solve. I want to be able to do binding. I want to be able to combine things. I want to be able to do sequencing. And how do I, how do, I um, do these things? And, and what Penti has also shown this approximates a field uh, in, in terms of uh, mathematics. Okay, so I, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna just skip ahead um, to the um, end and uh, happy to talk later about some of the examples of high dimensional computing. But, but this is something that we're, we're working on a lot in my own lab right now, is trying to apply this idea of high dimensional computing to an array of uh, different problems in vision, in audition, in uh, speech recognition, and ultimately in, in robotics. And we're also working on a project for, uh, of using, the, using this framework as a model of the cerebellum. Okay, so, so the, I'll just summarize kind of the, the main points here I've tried to leave you with, is that, uh, is that I, I think the, the field of artificial intelligence uh, deep learning, computational modeling, and so forth, it has a lot to gain by embrace, embracing these complexities that we find in biology. So the rich computational capabilities of single neurons, what they can do, the diversity of neuron types, I didn't get to talk about that a lot, but uh, the canonical microcircuits, you see these laminar structures in the cortex, so what are the computational different roles in these different layers? Uh, the bi-directional flow of information is probably hugely important, so how um, information flows in these feedback loops there's probably a lot that can be gained from that, and the field is really just at a loss for even how to think about that right now, okay? Uh, and then in terms of what problems we should be solving, um, acting in the real physical world, like insects and spiders and all these other animals have to do, they're solving some problems we don't normally think about, which are probably enormously important and, and we're overlooking right now. 
Uh, and so the other is in terms of vision, thinking about surface representation rather than feature extraction, rather than sort of extracting two-dimensional features from the image. How do you represent surfaces in the world and group things together? Uh, and, and then also this idea of learning from sensory, sensory motor contingencies that Alvin Noe and Kevin O'Regan have, have advanced in the joint sensory motor space. And finally, you know, as I mentioned before, I think a really new, new kinds of math are going to be needed to understand and the system, but to potentially new, newish kinds of directions I, I'm, I'm very excited about is one is this framework of David Mumford, the pattern theory, and um, the high dimensional computing framework, which I think has a lot of mileage, and probably many others. Okay, so um, that's it. I'm happy to take questions.